Simone, you better come look. I think it's still alive. Alrighty, what do we got here? Jeez, it's a lion. Run, Pooba, move it. Hey, Jamon, it's just a little lion. Look at him. He's so cute and all alone. Can we keep him? Pumpa, are you nuts? You're talking about a lion. Lions eat guys like us. But he's so little. He's gonna get bigger. Maybe he'll be on our side. <laughs> ah, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Maybe he'll be... Hey, I've got it. What if he's on our side? You know, having a lion around might not be such a bad idea. So we're keeping him? <laughs> of course. Who's the brains in this outfit? Uh... My point exactly. Jeez, I'm fried. Let's get out of here and find some shade. You okay, kid? I guess so. You nearly died. I saved you. Well, uh, Pumba helped. A little. Thanks for your help. Hey, where you going? Nowhere. Gee, he looks blue. I'd say brownish gold. No, no, no. I mean, he's depressed. Oh. Kid, what's eating you? Nothing. He's at the top of the food chain. <laughs> <laughs> the food chain! <laughs> so, where you from? Who cares? I can't go back. Ah, you're an outcast. That's great. So are we. What'd you do, kid? Something terrible, but I don't want to talk about it. Good. We don't want to hear about it. Come on, Timon. Anything we can do? Not unless you can change the past. You know, kid, in times like this, my buddy Timon here says you gotta put your behind in your piss. No, no, uh, no. I mean... Amateur, lie down before you hurt yourself. It's you gotta put your past behind you. Look, kid, bad things happen, and you can't do anything about it, right? Right. Wrong! When the world turns its back on you, you turn your back on the world. Well, that's not what I was taught. Then maybe you need a new lesson. Repeat after me. <clears throat> when the world turns its back on you, you decide to turn your back on the world? Really? Is that supposed to be a solution to anything? Welcome to the next lecture in the video series entitled The Lost Prince. Now, before we get into Timon and Puma, I want to discuss the foundations of friendship, okay? So that way we can use these foundations to analyze these two characters, all right? So... In order to get to the two kinds of friendship, though, I'm going to need help from some great philosophers like Aristotle and Nietzsche. And to better communicate it to you, I'm going to need the help of two of the best heroes out there, Superman and Batman. All right. So let's analyze Superman first. So before I get into Superman's idea of friendship and the people he keeps around him, I want to go over generally the three kinds of friendship according to Aristotle. Okay, so this is going to be short, though, because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Basically, Aristotle believed in three kinds of friendship. Um, the most short-lived is a friendship based on emotion. You know, you see this a lot in younger people. Um, what this is, is when two people are enjoying kind of mutual interests. Um, they enjoy doing things together. It's, it's an emotional source of, of love. Um, you'll see this on sports teams, for example, when two individuals are, are working towards a common aim because it's a common interest. Um, but the problem with this is taste changes. Preferences change. You know, you may be able to bond with somebody over your love of, double cheese pizza but that's not going to be um that's not a very long lasting kind of love uh obviously because you'll get sick of double stuffed uh pizza or double cheesed pizza just as fast as you'll get over this relationship but the point is this relationship is based on emotion and it's based on taste so that's why it's the most short-lived and so then the second type of friendship is a friendship of utility. You see this a lot in older individuals, but more importantly, you see this a lot in businesses where two coworkers are working towards mutual aims and they're providing a utility 
to each one. That is, they're both providing a service to the other. Now, this actually lasts a lot longer than the, than the emotion because not only is there a common interest, each one is participating in carrying the load. Um, but it's obviously not permanent because either one person will start producing more than the other or their common goal might change. It still lasts longer, though, than the friendship based on emotion or based on pleasure. The highest, however, is the friendship of the good. And that's what we see in Superman. Superman believes it's the character of the individual that one ought to love or like. So friends are those who love each other's characters, who accept each other's characters. And what that does is one person actually has an ideal of the other that the other tries to stand up to. So think about that. Both people become better because of the adoration they have for one another's characters, the acceptance of, one, of each other's characters. What does that look like? Well, if one person succeeds, the other one's happy for them. There's no resentment in their heart. They're truly happy that the other one is doing well. There's no competition between the two. They're there for the, each other's characters. And that's what Superman seemed to prioritize. Look at his friends or his closest friends, Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen, for example. These two individuals don't really offer much to Superman in the practical sense. You know, Superman is Superman, faster than a speeding bullet, or more powerful than a locomotive. You know, he is indestructible. They can't offer much to Superman as far as physical strength and speed and things like that. So what he's left with is characteristics. And that's what they offer him. Lois Lane is smarter than Superman, you know? But he loves her for her wit and her sass. Jimmy Olsen is just an honest, faithful individual. And he's also loyal. These are things Superman also appreciates. See, Superman is in it for the character of the other individual, you know? So that's one type of friendship that's very Aristotelian. It's the characteristic of the people that matter. Aristotle believes that only good people can love each other truly. And so you have to be a good person. And what you, what you appreciate about the other person is their great and good quality. All right. Now, with that in mind, let's move on to Batman. Batman is more of the Nietzschean. And according to Nietzsche in his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in your friend, you shall love the overman as your cause. What this means is the individual you love and appreciate, your friend is one that can actually help your cause. I know this sounds bad, but think about in Batman says, who does Batman keep close to him? Robin, Alfred, Huntress, Oracle, uh, Catwoman. All of these individuals offer something practical to Batman. Why? Well, Batman's a man. He's a normal man. Some could look at this and just say, well, those are acquaintances. That's not actual friendship. And you may have a good argument there. But think about this, okay? In Batman's sense, at least they're both bringing something to the table. Both of them need to help each other with their lives. Neither one of them are baggage. It's more of a friendship built on reciprocity. One helping the other in this world that we need to endure. There's also a sense of equality here. Because reciprocity needs to have an aspect of equality or it becomes tilted. So Batman is more of a Nietzschean in this aspect where he believes there needs to be some kind of reciprocity. Now, what's the right answer? Well, the right answer lies in Batman and Superman's relationship. So Superman, his focus is still Aristotelian, still the character. And in Batman, he sees somebody that keeps him in check. In the comic book Justice League of America, um, Tower of Babel, 
we find out that Batman actually has a contingency plan to take out every single member of the Justice League, Wonder Woman, Flash, and Superman alike, although there is more of it. I just don't remember them at this time. The point was Batman had a contingency plan for these people. He had a way to take out Flash. He had a way to take out Wonder Woman. He had a way, he had a way to take out Superman. Now the main reason I called this session, in light of the breach of trust revealed to us during the Vandal Savage matter, we have to decide whether Batman should be allowed to remain in the League. All those in favor of- Wait. Before we vote, I think the accused should be allowed a few words in his defense. Seconded. Okay. Batman? My actions don't require any defense. In the same situation, I'd do it again. Aw, oh, come on! As individuals, and even more so as a group, the Justice League is far too dangerous to lack a failsafe against any possible misuse of our power. We use our power to protect the world. We always have. And what if we ever used it for some other purpose? If you people can't see the potential danger of an out-of-control Justice League, I don't need to wait for a vote. I don't belong here. And in that, Superman ends up giving Batman a kryptonite ring. Got a minute? He What do you want? You made contingency plans to stop everybody in the League just in case any one of us ever went bad. My contingencies were intended to immobilize, not kill. But Savage came up with a plan to bury you. I assume so. It wasn't one of mine. Was that it? With all that talk about unchecked power, you're still so arrogant you didn't bother to come up with a plan to stop yourself? I do have a plan. It's called the Justice League. Just wanted to be sure. What is it? If the League ever did go over to the wrong side, I want there to be somebody I can trust to keep the planet safe. Even from me. He values Batman's friendship for Batman being able to keep him in check because Batman's character is even above his own ego. That is to say that even Batman wants to make sure people can take him out if need be. But also at the same time, he doesn't trust anyone else. He believes that a character or somebody's character can become corrupt. So he needs a contingency plan. He even has a contingency plan against himself. So Superman sees in Batman a person who keeps him in check and makes him better. Such the Aristotelian. But... Look at how Batman sees Superman. Batman doesn't want Superman's powers. Batman actually recognizes that he himself is prone to weakness. Batman has weaknesses as a human being because all human beings are flawed. That's what Batman understands. So on one side, he knows he doesn't want Superman's powers. In fact, he's, he's straight out said it. But on the other side, he appreciates and maybe holds Superman's character as an ideal. He wishes he could be more optimistic. Batman wishes he could be more trusting, but he can't. He knows too much about human nature and how human beings are flawed. So with that understanding, though, Batman sees Superman's weaknesses, and it's not his strength. It's how his strength can be used incorrectly. Batman is teaching Superman what it truly means to be human, because Superman is basically a demigod trying to pretend to be human. He's an alien pretending to be human. And what Batman is teaching him is not everyone is that farm-loving family that you were raised with, Clark. Clark is uh, Superman's real name. Batman is teaching Superman what humanity lacks, how we are flawed. He can't just be optimistic all the time. So Batman sees the weaknesses in Superman, and he is that opposition. He's actually a teacher to Superman in this sense. So his friendship with Superman is Nietzschean in the case that there is some equal reciprocity going on. 
Batman is offering things to Superman that makes Superman better. And Superman realizes this. Superman doesn't like Batman's character. In fact, he often thinks Batman's a little too dark. But he likes his utility and function as it makes Superman a better person. That's why he entrusted him with the kryptonite ring. On the reverse side, Batman doesn't care for Superman's utility. He's actually very skeptical because omniscient power is something he wonders can be turned against him. But Batman likes the character of Superman because his character provides hope. So in this case, they both switch their stances when it comes to friendship. Superman, who values character, likes the utility and function of Batman because it makes Superman a better person. And Batman, who normally prioritizes utility and function, is inspired by the character of Superman that provides him hope and optimism. Superman is a demigod trying to earn people's trust in the world. Batman is a man just trying to hold chaos at bay and is very pessimistic about humanity. So them together make a really solid idea of friendship. But those are still two kinds of friendship. But what happens if either of those two sides go too far? In Superman's case, what if there's no reciprocity? That is to say, in Superman's sense, he just focuses on the character, the good-natured character of the individual. But what happens if that goes too far? I.e., what if there's zero reciprocity like there is in Batman's case? It's all Obi-Wan's fault. He's jealous. He's holding me back. Well, these people just become a liability over time. They're not helping him. That is an, it is an unequal relationship. He's not gaining anything from it. They end up holding him back. Now, in Batman's sense, it's much easier to see what happens when it goes too far. If you take the reciprocal part of friendship too far, in Batman's case, it becomes parasitic. That is to say, if you only value another one's friendship in so much as they are a benefit to you or help you through life, it becomes parasitic. You are only as good as you are useful. And as soon as you stop being useful, please help me. Oh, thank you, boss. <laughs> sure. I have no use for a paralyzed Saiyan. You're dead weight now. That's right, you're taken out. So you can see how the extremes of both sense don't work. But what I want to focus on here is the two kinds of friendship. There needs to be reciprocity. There needs to be equality. But there also needs to be this aspect of good character. One that offers a mutual love or adoration or even respect of each other's characteristics. Now let's go to Timon and Pumbaa. Pumbaa's easy. He sees Simba and immediately says, oh, look, he's so cute and all alone. There's this aspect of innocence to Simba. And innocence is really just goodness, you know? An innocent individual is considered good. Um, we have this saying in moral philosophy. If you come up with an ethic that doesn't have at its foundation protecting the innocent, it can't even be seen as a moral theory, you know? All moral theories have to have as its foundation a protection of the innocent. So for Pumbaa, we have that in spades. You know, he obviously has a good heart. He really cares about Simba. In that, Simba is a good character. That's that's Superman all over. But in Timon, we don't see any friendship whatsoever. He's a false friend, ascribing certain characteristics of cult and gang-like leaders in the way he approaches Simba in these clips. Jeez, it's a lion! Run, Pumbaa! So Timon's initial instinct is, 
oh, it's a lion. We need to get out of here. But what changes his mind? Can we keep him? Bumper, are you nuts? You're talking about a lion. Lions eat guys like us. But he's so little. He's gonna get bigger. Maybe he'll be on our side. <laughs> uh, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Maybe he'll be... Hey, I got it. What if he's on our side? You know, having a lion around might not be such a bad idea. That's right. He realizes Simba could be useful. But it's still Timon's gang right now. And like all gang and cult leaders, before Simba is welcomed, he must pass the initiation phase. And that's what happens here. Kid, what's eating you? Nothing. He's at the top of the food chain. <laughs> <laughs> the food chain! <laughs> <coughs> so, where are you from? The first thing Timon targets is Simba's physical stature. And really, his, his nature as a lion. He often jokes about that kind of thing, but it gets more serious later on. Timon immediately recognizes Simba's hierarchy. Simba's a lion, king of the jungle. Timon is a meerkat. Meerkats average 1.6 pounds in adult males. What is he going to do? He obviously realizes he is nothing compared to Simba. So what is he going to do? Well, he's going to do what anybody with his physical limitations would do. Timon needs to neutralize the threat. I'm so hungry I could eat a whole zebra. Ah, we're fresh out of zebra. Any antelope? Nuh-uh. Hippo? Nope. Listen, kid, if you live with us, you have to eat like us. Hey, this looks like a good spot to rustle up some grub. Ew, what's that? A grub. What's it look like? Ew, gross. So in here, he notices again, and I believe this is the third time he brings up a food chain dominance-like aspect in the conversation. But this time, he's like, we're all out of antelope. And he says, look, kid, if you want to live with us, you're going to have to eat like us. What did you do? I took Gotham's white knight and I brought him down to our level. It wasn't hard. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> so he needs to bring Simba down to his level. He needs to take down his dominance. And what better way to attack his very nature of wanting to eat meat? No, in order to stay with us, you need to eat bugs. In doing so, he took the possible future of a Simba who was proud and strong like his father, and he turned Simba into this. If you haven't noticed yet, this is much like gang leaders' initiations and what cult leaders do. When a new initiate comes in, they have a lot of power and strength. That threatens the leader. And for Timon, he needs to do this. Literally shaving down his claws, but metaphorically taking down his teeth. That's right. Timon needs to make sure Simba loses his teeth. He doesn't have bite. He won't eat them at night. This is an all too common tactic of gang leaders and cult leaders. The last thing a person of power wants is to lose that power. All who gain power are afraid to lose it. So after targeting Simba's physical and instinctual uh, characteristics, Timon is then gonna attack Simba's mental acuity his mental philosophy, because Simba's coming in with guidance from Mufasa on how to live, on how to be responsible. And man, these kind of leaders, they need to do away with that immediately. Let the brainwashing begin. So Timon says, Hakuna Matata. This is the philosophy you need to abide by in order to stay in our game. And let me read you some characteristics from this book called Dangerous Personalities by Joe Navarro. A cult leader publicly devalues others as being inferior, incapable, or not worthy. A cult leader habitually puts down others as inferior. Only he is superior. 
A cult leader needs to be the center of attention and does things to distract others to ensure that he or she is being noticed. Haughtiness and grandiosity and the need to be controlling is a part of this cult leader's personality. He demands blind and unquestioned obedience. More importantly, as we see here, he has isolated the group physically, removed them from family to a remote area. And lastly, he believes he possesses the answers and solutions to the world's problems. Enter the philosophy of Hakuna Matata. It means no worries. Stick with us. You'll have no worries for the rest of your day. Yeah, sing it, kid. But how does he approach this philosophy? Then maybe you need a new lesson. Repeat after me. <clears throat> Repeat after me. I'm sure you've seen this kind of brainwashing before. People often make fun of it with things like this. One of us! One of us! Mutant. Congratulations, you're officially one of us! <laughs> one of us! One of us! One of us! One of us! One of us, one of us, one. But that doesn't mean there's a hint of truth that allows people to do this. See, Timon is telling Simba what to think, just like Scar did with his hyenas. The point here is the same tactic that Scar used. He needed to take away the hyena's individuality. So here we have Timon telling Simba what to think, what to eat, and the philosophy Simba needs to abide by in order to stay with them. Once you take away their individuality, their individuality is lost. And that's why Peter Pan refers to his gang of misfits as the Lost Boys. No, not those Lost Boys. These Lost Boys. So, in conclusion, true friendship, the one that Pumbaa kind of shows here, and the one Batman and Superman have, is a powerful thing that needs to be protected when found, but is also extremely rare. A true friend is happy when you're happy and is proud when you are successful without an ounce of resentment. They honor and love your characteristics, but they also push back when you're heading in the wrong direction and disagree with you when you're wrong. They make you a better person. So for this week's assignment, I want you to explain in your own words those two kinds of friendships the Superman or Aristotelian notion of friendship, and the Batman or Nietzschean aspect of friendship. I want you to explain those two friendships in your own words. And then I want you to answer the question, what would be your ideal friendship and why? See you next time.